Welcome to Food for Thought. Today's episode is Animal Inspired Pasta. Hi everyone, my name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. If you're interested in vegan travel, you can check out joyfulvegantrips.com. This podcast, Food for Thought, is 100% listener supported. There are no ads or sponsors on Food for Thought, so please join other supporters by going to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to become a supporter today at your chosen level. Thank you so much for doing so. Thanks for supporting, for subscribing, and for listening to Food for Thought. And if you would, I would be so grateful if you could go over to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a rating and review. If you've been following my work for a while, you know that one of the things I do is examine the animal-related words and expressions we use every day. Animal-related words and expressions I call animologies. I have been doing this for many years. You can find a TEDx talk on animologies. It's called Animology. And I had a podcast. We had a podcast pad, podcast spinoff uh, called Animology, which um, went on for a year. And just because it's a lot to manage two podcasts, I decided to just pull back, focus on food for thought. That doesn't mean we can't include animologies in this podcast. So here we are. And one of the reasons I started looking at animologies is because I have always wanted to be the most effective communicator on behalf of animals and because I have an insatiable desire to understand the roots of words we use. And so over the years, I've discovered hundreds, hundreds of words and idioms and metaphors and proverbs and everyday expressions, even if you're interested in this quite fascinating letters of the alphabet. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. that reflect how deeply connected we are to other animals and how integral they are to who we are as human beings, as compassionate human beings specifically. Now, when I say that, I want to emphasize that some of these animologies are positive and some are pejorative, but they all do reflect how deeply rooted animals are in our consciousness, in our history, in our hearts, in our language, and in our habits, including in our food. So if you look at the various types of pasta, for instance, typically speaking, they tend to be named for their resemblance to other objects, right? Spaghetti, for example, comes from the Italian word spago, meaning string, and that's because it resembles a long string, right? This long shape. Orecchiette is called because it's shaped like a human ear. Ear is orecchio in Italian. Cappellini is a very thin type of Italian pasta, and its literal meaning is fine hair. It's also poetically called angel hair. Uh, you've got a pasta called fiori because it's uh, shaped like a flower, fiori flowers. Uh, lanterne because it's shaped like a lantern. So you get the idea. We give names to things that remind us of something else we have a close association with or a close relationship with, whether it be persons or places or things we see in our everyday lives. And so it's not surprising that we have several types of pasta named because of their resemblance to animals. So let's take a look and start with one that goes by several names, a couple names, one of which is bow ties, because this pasta looks like a little bow tie, right? But whose Italian name will be familiar to you, I think, and that is farfalle, farfalle, F-A-R-F-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E. farfalle means butterfly. Well, Technically, farfalla means butterfly, farfalle means butterflies. Um, but without even looking it up, you can imagine these pretty little bits of pasta shaped like butterfly wings. Uh, there's also farfallone, which means large butterflies. One meaning large, right? Farfallone means large butterflies. And farfalle is definitely one of the most common pastas, I think, in many people's homes, certainly in our home. Uh, my husband loves it. It's definitely one of his favorites. He loves to toss it simply with either some garlic and olive oil uh, and greens or with tomato sauce or pesto. So you've got lots of options for it. And it's a, it's a really good a pasta that's interchangeable with other ones like penne. Uh, it's also really good for cold pasta salads. Uh, you know, with like some eggless mayonnaise and some raw vegetables, etc. So that's farfalle. Farfalle named such because of its resemblance 
to butterflies. Next, you have a pasta that is called conchiglie. Conchiglie. And conchiglie literally means little shells. I'll spell it for you. C H I in Italian is pronounced with a K sound, so chi, so con, C O N, C H I G L I E, conchiglie. And that means little shells. The name derives from the Italian word for seashell, which again in this case, conchiglia would be the singular, but conchiglie is the plural. So seashell is conchiglia in Italian, and you can see that the Italian word conchiglie has the English word conch. We're used to the, uh, the English word conch, uh, which uh, both share the uh, Latin root, which means shell. I'm sure you've cooked with this pasta before, at least you've eaten it, I'm sure, and you can imagine the really cute shells. I mean, you've probably seen it um, in like macaroni bakes, uh, and you can do that at home. So uh, conchiglie for like macaroni bakes or any kind of cheesy bakes in place of ziti, you can use uh, a conchiglie. And uh, it is an etymology, by the way, because of course a shell is the hard protective outer layer of an animal who lives in the sea, right? And so when we find empty seashells on the shore, on the beach, it's because they're empty because the animal has died and the soft parts have most likely been eaten by another animal or they've decomposed. So you've got the empty shell remaining, but there was an animal in there at one time. So conchiglie is an animology meaning little shells. Next, we have lumake, which is a snail-shaped pasta whose name means snail. Like farfalle, lumake is the plural. Lumaca is the singular for snail. So lumake literally means snails, and it's made with wheat like the other ones I just named. It's a really pretty pasta that is sometimes available in green with the addition of spinach. Sometimes it's available in red made with the addition of tomato puree. And it's a really pretty fun cut. It's not just a shell shape like a conchiglie. It has a pinched end. And so what's nice about it in terms of food is that it traps the sauce in the main part of the shell because it's pinched at the end. So the sauce would kind of sit inside and it's really delicious. So this one also has a version which is large. So if you see it on a box or in a restaurant on a menu, instead of lumake, you might see lumaconi, and that means large uh, snails. So lumaconi or lumake, and I'll spell that L-U-M-A-C-H-E. Remember again that C-H is a hard K sound. So lumake or lumaconi, meaning snails. Next, we have calamarata. And calamarata, as you could probably hear in the word, I'm hoping you're starting to guess now, is a wide ring-shaped pasta from Napoli. It's in southern Italy. And the word calamarata means squid-like from Italian calamaro, which means squid, right? Now, it must be said, I feel like I need to say this, that... When you look at the shape of calamarata, it does resemble squid after the squid has been cut up, right? So you can imagine calamari, I'm saying it in Italian, <laughs> in calamari, like, right, the little rings that are usually battered and fried. That's how I ate calamari when I was growing up. I'm sure you've had it as well. And so I guess what I just want to say is that's not exactly what the animal looks like when they're alive. They're not little rings. Um, that's how they're cut up. So even though this is an animology related to the shape of the animal, it's really related to the shape of how we cut the animal up before eating it. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Calamarata pasta is used in traditional pasta dishes, also in the south, in Campania, in Calabria, and in Sicily. And it's often served with calamari. But one thing to consider, tip from the hip, is that you can make your own delicious plant-based dish reminiscent of calamari using mushrooms. Mushrooms, of course, have a wonderful chewy texture that some people don't like because it's chewy. But that has the same effect. And for instance, if you come to Oakland and you go to Millennium Restaurant, one of the best dishes they make 
are there oyster mushrooms? It's, they're always on the menu. They've been making them for almost 30 years. They're always on the starter menu. They're the best thing you will ever eat. So amazing. We get them every time. We like walk into Millennium and they're like, can we get you started on anything? We're just like, just bring us mushrooms. Like before we even, let's not even, just, just dispense with the niceties. Just bring us the mushrooms because they're so good. And the best way I can describe them for better or for worse, so you might like calamari and say, oh, that's amazing because I would say, it tastes like calamari because they're breaded and they're fried and they have that same chewy texture and you might go, that's great. Or you might go, eh, I don't like that, so I don't want that. But either way, they're amazing, trust me. And so that is something you can do as well. So instead of having these poor little cut up squid, you can have it, same kind of thing, chewiness, fried, battered with mushrooms. Another tip from the hip is beware that um, calamarata, sometimes if it's black, it's often because it's been dyed with black squid ink. Okay, so things to keep in mind. And if you're interested in other words we have from these particular creatures, whether it's squid or any kind of uh, similar animal from the sea, listen to the episodes I did in animology on colors. So I have two uh, it's a two-parter on the words we have that come from the colors of animals. One is all about the colors we have, like colors we still name, that came from animals being crushed, or in this case, like squid ink, and you'll see what I mean when you go listen. And then you have um, colors that are just named because they are inspired by the colors of animals. So I think that's fascinating, and so I invite you to go listen to those episodes. But that is Calamarata, named such because of um, their squid-like in appearance. Next, we have a pasta that's maybe less familiar to you. I can't say that I was very familiar with this. When I, when I see the picture, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I can see that. But I don't think it's something that we see a lot here, especially in the store as dried pasta. And that is a pasta called Creste di Galli. And that is a pasta, I'm going to break it down for you, creste, which means crest, um, of di galli. And galli translates to rooster, so rooster's crest is what creste di galli means. It's very popular in Italy, even if you haven't seen it, uh, and that's the name of it. It's named because it uh, looks like it resembles the rooster's crest, um, because Creste galli means roosters. Gallo, again, is singular for rooster. And yes, smarty pants, if you just made the connection between the Spanish word for rooster, gallo, G-A-L-L-O, so in Italian it's pronounced gallo, so two L's is a long L sound, gallo, and in Spanish it would be gallo. So if you're thinking pico di gallo, you're thinking well, what is Pico de Gallo. Why is Pico de Gallo named after a rooster? That is an etymology. So Pico de Gallo, right, that uh, wonderful sauce, right, salsa, spicy sauce, uh, is that's Pico de Gallo. And it's translated in Spanish or in English from Spanish. It means beak of a rooster. Pico meaning beak. So Pico de Gallo means beak of a rooster. And some believe it's because it was originally eaten by pinching between the thumb and the finger, making the shape of a rooster's beak. That sounds a little too cute to me. I'm usually suspicious of those really cutesy etymology or et etymologies, <laughs> I should say, but no one really knows for sure. But that is Pico de Gallo. We do have an etymology there. So back to Creste di Galli. It's a short, curved, tubular pasta with a ruffled edge that runs along the length of the outside curve, and it hails from Napoli as well. So you can just type it in, look it up, and you can see it for yourself. This one, also really great as casseroles. Um, it's really good in soups. Uh, it can be substituted for forfale or macaroni. macaroni. Um, and gili is another one. Uh, you can substitute um, the creste di galli for uh, gili is a really pretty pasta that's shaped like the lily flower. Gili means lily. Look that one up. It's super pretty. I don't see that a lot on restaurant menus, and I certainly don't see it as dried pasta a lot here in the United States, but check it out, look it up, really pretty. But there's another etymology for you from of pasta, Creste di Galli. Next, we have another pasta named for its resemblance to the body part of an animal, and that is Occhi di Lupo. Occhi di Lupo. So the first word is Occhi, 
O-C-C-H-I, again, there's that C-H pronounced with the K sound. I keep saying this because I know that one of the things that people are so tempted to do is say bruschetta when they're, when they're you know, getting that very popular dish, even in the United States. We see it on menus all over the place. And that B-R-U-S-C-H-E-T-T-A, a lot of people say bruschetta. The C-H, like a Chianti in Italian, right? Chianti, the wine, um, it's, a, it's a hard K sound. So if you ever see a C-H, in Italian, it's, it's an Italian word, it is pronounced with a K sound. So, occhi, occhi, di lupo. And hopefully you can guess what lupo means. Lupo meaning wolf. So, occhi di lupo means wolf eyes. It's a large penne shaped pasta that kind of looks like ziti to me. I mean, it's, it looks like penne, right? A large penne or a ziti. So, just imagine that kind of a tubular uh, shape. Um, and so h- how it became the eyes of a wolf, I have no idea. Apparently, some would say if you look at the pasta tube from the end, the cross section resembles a wolf's eye. I am not sure I see it resembling a wolf's eye any more than any other animal's eyes or any eyes. <laughs> but perhaps, perhaps, just perhaps, it's because the wolf uh, is pretty prevalent in Italian culture and folklore. So that's possible is why why a wolf side, right? Just kind of arbitrary. Um, and the wolf is very popular. You, you can see it throughout Italian folklore and culture. For instance, a common phrase in Italian is in bocca a lupo. In bocca a lupo. And it literally means in the mouth of the wolf. And it's the equivalent in Italian of saying break a leg in English. Like in the theater, when you're wishing good luck to someone, you would say break a leg. In Italian, you would say in bocco a lupo, which means kind of the same thing. It's tradition, actually, in Italy for opera singers to give a toast to the wolf before a performance. So an example of how a wolf kind of is prevalent in Italian culture. Um, And if you remember... Our discussions about St. Francis of Assisi, you've heard me, if you follow me on social media, talk about Assisi being one of my favorite places in Italy, and which is always part of our Tuscany itinerary, even though it's technically in Umbria, we go to Assisi, and we will be going to Assisi again on our Tuscany trip 2022, and it is truly one of the most beautiful places. And so we've talked about St. Francis of Assisi here on the podcast related to his relationship with animals. And one of the legends of St. Francis is that he tamed a wolf who was wreaking havoc on a nearby city called Gubbio, and the wolf became his companion as a result. Uh, So the wolf factors into the Italian consciousness quite a bit, and perhaps that's why it was chosen as the animals whose eyes resemble this pasta shape. I'm not really sure. But if you're interested in trying it, uh, this dried pasta is also from southern Italy, particularly Napoli, and it's often served with stuffing or filling whose ingredients typically include olive oil, um, cheese, you'd use non-dairy cheese, uh, parsley, basil, that kind of thing. So you can easily make a plant-based version, uh, but look it up so you can see what I'm talking about. And that is Oki di Lupo, Eyes of the Wolf. Okay, after saying all that about wolves being prevalent in Italian culture, <laughs> there, there is another pasta called Oki di Passero. Oki di Passero. And Passero, P-A-S-S-E-R-O, means sparrow. sparrow. So Oki di Passero means sparrow's eyes. And there's another one called Occhi di Pernice, which is shaped into tiny rings. They look like miniature discs with a hole in the middle, and that name translates to partridge's eyes. And it really is quite unique and interesting looking. This type of pasta is ideal for also soups, like kind of small, like putting a little pasta inside the soups, um, and broths where it's used most of the time. And I really want to get my hands on some because it looks really interesting. So look up Occhi di Pernice, and that's spelled P-E-R-N-I-C-E, Pernice. That's partridges, eyes, another animology. And sticking with our bird theme, we have a pasta dish, not a pasta, so I'm stretching it just a little, but I can because it's my podcast. So it's not a pasta per se, but it's a pasta dish, and that's called Nidi di Rondine, and it means swallow's nest. Also, I've seen it as code di rondine, which means the 
tail of um, the bird, the, the swallow, um, but Nidi di Rondine, you'll see, it's an original recipe from the little country of San Marino. And San Marino, San Marino, is one of the smallest countries in the world, and we just visited it on our last trip to Italy. So if you look it up on a map, it's really interesting because it's right in the, well, I shouldn't say it's in the middle of Italy, but it is in the middle of Italy. <laughs> and uh, it's its own country. So it has a very interesting history. I would highly recommend checking it out. It marked the 17th country that I traveled with my travel partners to. David and I have traveled to now 17 countries. And we were really excited to go. We've been to Italy together. So when we did our Tuscany trip in 2021, we were excited just to get out and go and travel and bring our travelers again. But having been to Italy together, of course, that wasn't a new country, so that didn't go on our list. But we were able to go to San Marino, which is right in the middle of Italy, and we got a 17th country in. So very excited about that. So check out San Marino. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And the dish gets its name because the rolled up pasta somewhat resembles a swallow's nest. So in this case, you've got Code di Rondine and Nidi di Rondine, swallow's nest. Code, uh, by the way, di rondine means uh, the tail. I think I said that. Coda, like coda, uh, C-O-D-A, uh, is uh, tail. Next, a very familiar pasta, no doubt, I've named it a few times already, is penne. Now, I'm going to explain to you why this qualifies as a an animology, if you just, just bear with me here. So penne... P-E-N-N-E is the plural form of the Italian penna, P-E-N-N-A, from Latin penna, meaning feather or quill. So it's a cognate of the English word pen, which comes from Latin penna, meaning feather. And that's why I've included penne as an etymology, because penne comes from Latin penna, and penna comes from Latin penna, meaning feather. Now, I plan on doing an entire episode on all the words from this animological root, but in the meantime, here is one, penne. Penne pasta literally means pens because the tip uh, is similar to that of a fountain pen or a quill, which of course is a writing instrument that when it first came about as a writing instrument, when it was first invented, when it was first used, it had a feather on top. So you didn't have pens you had quills, but it was they were they would have been called penne. <laughs> they were uh, had a feather on top, and you can't separate that from an animal. A feather comes from an animal. A feather doesn't come from a from the soil. It's not a plant. It's from an animal. And so, penna in Latin meaning feather is how we get the word pen because pens were quills, and quills had animal feathers on them. And so, if you have a word like penne to name a pasta because it resembles the pen. In my mind, that is an etymology. okay? So I'd like to hear your thoughts about that if you disagree, but I am going with that. And maybe wait to judge me until you hear the whole episode on all of the words that come from, from that same root. So penette is a short uh, version of penne. You can again look that up. It's just a shorter version of, of the pasta. Penette, and it means uh, little pens. And penoni, now you're getting the idea here. It's a wider, thicker version of penne. So you've got penone. So that's another kind of pasta. But penne is an etymology. Moving from tubular pasta to strand pasta, we've already named spaghetti, but spaghetti is not an etymology. So what about another strand pasta that? would be an etymology, one that would be very familiar to you, and that is vermicelli, which literally means little worms, which I know is probably not what you want to think about when you're eating pasta, but that's where it comes from. <laughs> so we get vermicelli from the Italian vermicelli, which is a plural of vermicello, which is a diminutive of verme, which comes from the Latin word vermis, meaning worm, right? Vermis, worm, vermicello, vermicelli, and it means little worms. But that is the inspiration. As unappetizing as it is, that is the inspiration behind the name of this pasta that first emerged in Italy about 600 years ago. But 
Vermicelli is not just used in Italian cuisine. There are two main types of vermicelli. You've got the Italian vermicelli, right? Just plain vermicelli, just the long strands uh, of pasta. And then you've got Asian vermicelli, which is basically rice vermicelli. It's often called rice vermicelli. And so the Italian noodles are made from a durum wheat flour, like a lot of the pastas we're talking about. And it can be used like any other pasta, right? Especially used in place of spaghetti or angel hair, uh, capellini. And it's especially fantastic with tomato sauce. But then you've got Asian rice vermicelli noodles that are not called that in their native Asian countries. In fact, they would have a plethora of names depending on the cuisine and the origin, but they picked up the moniker in English-speaking regions due to their similar shape to Italian vermicelli, which is long and thin, right? But the Asian vermicelli would be made from rice flour, not wheat flour. So you'll see that in especially Southeast Asian cuisines, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Thai, also Chinese. In fact, I'm just going to throw this out to anybody who is in the San Francisco Bay Area. There is a wonderful vegetarian. I think they started as a pop-up, so I'll just call them a pop-up because I don't know that there is an actual restaurant you can go to. So they're, let's just call them a pop-up for all intents and purposes, and we order them on Uber Eats. They are a Chinese vegetarian restaurant pop-up, and their food is so good, and it's called Cozy Walk, and we will get them. That's one of our go-to, you know, take-in, take-out, delivery places. And yesterday, I had a good friend over, and we ordered in, and I had their vermicelli, which is a little spicy. It's got like a little curry uh, powder in the vermicelli noodles, and again, these are the rice noodles, and veggies, you know, just kind of stir-fried in, and they're absolutely delicious. So check out Cozy Walk if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area. They are Oakland-based. I don't know if they travel across to San Francisco, but they're Oakland-based and they're fantastic. So we just had vermicelli yesterday, but the Asian vermicelli. And you'll see that also in like Vietnamese soups like pho. You'll see them in spring rolls. So you're familiar with vermicelli, uh, no doubt, in Asian cuisine, but it's it's not necessarily the same pasta as you'll find in uh, Italian cuisine, which originally started in Italy um, and called vermicelli because they resemble little worms. So there's our next etymology. Now I have a pasta that I had never heard of before prior to researching uh, for this episode, and that's a pasta called malo redus. Okay, malo redus, and that is M A L L O R E D D U S. Malo redus, and that is a pasta. You may know it if you are Sardinian. Okay. You might know it if you're Italian, but you may know it even more. I don't know if I have any Sardinian podcast listeners here, but please let me know if you have heard of it, if you are from Sardinia. And that is this word maloredus because it means fat little bulls, bulls as in uh, male uncastrated um, cattle. So fat little bulls, and ostensibly uh, it is a diminutive, maloredus is a diminutive of the word maloru, which is in Sardinian dialect, uh, and it means bull. So maloredus translates to fat little bulls because of their appearance. So they're made with durum wheat flour, water, salt, and they may have a pinch of saffron, which gives the dough a little bit of a yellow color tinge, which is so pretty, and this type of pasta pairs really nicely with a variety of sauces. Um, you, you can use it in place of gnocchi, which, uh, you, or you could use gnocchi in place of this, but you can even, actually it's even called Sardinian gnocchi because of its shape and because it looks like a little tiny potato gnocchi. So that is a very unique and very regional pasta called Melo Redus, and it is named such because of its resemblance to, well, let's just say fat little bulls, and it's from Sardinia. Next, we have a pasta that is not from Italy. You actually find it in such places as Germany, southern Germany, especially Austria, Switzerland. It's in Hungary, in Slovenia, in Alsace, and in South Tyrol. Uh, it's obviously claimed by a lot of places, not just one. It's typically made with chicken's eggs, but in Germany and in Austria and in Switzerland and in Alsace, and even recently in South Tyrol, because we were just there scouting our Northern Italy trip, 
which is happening in 2022 and we have one double room left, but it's 100% a go. So we were just in that region and we've all also had um, several trips to Alsace we've done um, in France, but because it is an area region that went back and forth between France and Germany, you can see a lot of German food influences there. So I have had this pasta made without eggs in those places because, well, A, I'm vegan <laughs> and, uh, and B, it, there, it's available, but you will typically find it made with eggs. So, so do note that when you're looking for this or when you see it on a menu, and that is Spatzel. Now, please forgive me I, I, if I am not pronouncing this correctly. It, some people pronounce it Spatzel. Some people pronounce it Spätzl, some people pronounce it Spatzl, some people pronounce it Spatzle. So I'm just going to say Spätzl just to make it easy, but forgive me if that's not how you pronounce it and please correct me and I'd be very happy to know if I'm completely butchering it. But basically it is, as I said, it is a, it, it's often made with eggs, but more than that, it, it's very moist and soft and it kind of resembles dumplings rather than like the rolled out pasta we know from Italy, right? So why is it an etymology? Well, the name comes most likely from the German word Spatzen, which means little sparrows. Sparrows are appearing again. Why little sparrows? Some people think that before there were uh, Spatzel tools, because there's actually Spatzel tools that you use to um, make this pasta. Um, you put the tool in the dough and it creates the shape that you're looking for. So some people think that before the Spatzel tools were available, people would just um, um, hold the pasta in their the dough in their hands like a little sparrow and then put small pinches in the in the dough in the water and kind of resembles this sparrow and that seems again unlikely another idea is that the dough was formed with two small spoons making little oval shapes that look like little sparrow bodies but we don't know for sure but that is another pasta whose name is an animology. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing how many pastas we have that come from uh, words for animals, animologies. So to recap, we have farfalle, meaning butterflies. We have conchiglie, meaning little shells. We have lumache, meaning snail-shaped. We have calamarata, meaning squid-like. We have creste di galli, meaning rooster's crest. We have occhi di lupo, meaning wolf eyes. We have occhi di passero, meaning sparrow's eyes. We have occhi di pernice, meaning partridge's eyes. We have code di rondine, meaning swallow's nest, and nidi di rondine, meaning swallow's nest. We have penne, coming from the Latin word for feather. We have vermicelli, meaning little worms. Malo redus, meaning fat little bulls. And spatzel, or spatzel, meaning little sparrows. So that is all I have. I would love to know if you know some that I have not detected, please reach out to me. You can do so at joyfulvegan.com. If you would like to enjoy eating pasta with me and eating other delicious delicacies in Italy or anywhere else I host my Joyful Vegan Trips, please check out where we're going at joyfulvegantrips.com. We've got some great trips coming up in 2022 and beyond. And let me know where you'd like to go because we always take your suggestions to heart. And remember, be kind to animals. Don't eat them, but you can eat food with animological names. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>